has been started. Good morning, our viewers. We are here again on a Saturday morning for a distinguished lecture series of the Council for Strategic Affairs. My name is Dr. Adityanji. And those of you who registered using our flyer probably saw this flyer. The topic of today's distinguished lecture is Bangladesh. Democracy, challenges, strategic concerns. Today is Saturday, November 25th, and our distinguished speaker is Ambassador Professor Veena Sikri. A little bit about Council for Strategic Affairs. CSA imparts education in the field of international relations. CSA fosters discussion, dialogue, and debate on geopolitical issues. The Council encourages strategic studies in general to raise the level of awareness. CSA supports track to diplomacy and cultural diplomacy. It fosters people to people dialogue to improve understanding. CSA condemns terrorism in all its form worldwide, and we aim to contribute towards world peace and prosperity. Some of our initiatives include a monthly roundtable discussion on the second Saturday of each month at 10 a.m. Eastern Daytime, a monthly guest lecture by a domain expert on fourth Saturday of each month that we are having now. We have a third feature called Strategically Speaking with Dr. Adityanji. It involves one-on-one -on -one interviews on issues of topical interest. We organize symposia, meetings, and conferences we promote publication of articles on geopolitical and related subjects. And finally, we have a research fellowship training program. So a little bit about our distinguished speaker, Ambassador Professor Veena Sikri. She is founding trustee and convener of South Asia Women's Network, SWAN. She is vice chair of South Asia Foundation in New Delhi. Her career and expertise straddle the words of academia and diplomacy. She served for 37 years as a career diplomat with Indian Foreign Service, including as High Commissioner to Bangladesh from 2003 to 2006. So she has first-hand experience of Bangladesh. She also served as High Commissioner to Malaysia from 2000 to 2003 and as Council General in Hong Kong, Director General of the ICCR in New Delhi. She has held challenging and prestigious assignments at Indian embassies in Moscow, Kathmandu, Paris, and at the permanent mission of India in the United Nations in New York. After retiring from IFS, Madam Veena Sikri joined Acad academia as professor holding the Ford Foundation Endowed Chair Academy of International Studies at Jamia Millia Islamia University in New Delhi from February 2009 to October 2013. She was also concurrently visiting senior research fellow with the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore. Her work at ISEAS resulted in a book on Malaysia-India relationships. I am very proud to say that she is a member of the International Advisory Board of the CSA and has very graciously appeared on our platform before and has given distinguished lectures before. So the topic is Bangladesh Democracy Challenges and Strategic Concerns. I'll just run over a couple of maps. So that shows you the map of Bangladesh in relation to India. That shows you the maps of Bangladesh with rivers and other things, how it is connected to India. And this is the political map of Bangladesh. So as you see that on three sides, Bangladesh is surrounded by India. 
and of course it was part of undivided british india bangladesh since its liberation from pakistan in 1971 has been in turmoil democratic rule of sheikh mujibur rahman was violently interrupted by a foreign agency inspired military coup military strongmen sought legitimacy by holding elections and forming political parties two political dynasties have alternated in bangladesh mainly elections are due in bangladesh on january 7 2024 this danger of jihadi terrorism in bangladesh and radicalization of the civic polity is looming very large and some people say that security threats are far greater from bangladesh than from pakistan so this is the picture of the founding father bang bandhu sheikh mujibur rahman this is another personality begum khalida jia and this is the current prime minister of bangladesh who is fighting for her political existence before i hand over the platform to our distinguished speaker a couple of housekeeping rules kindly mute yourself to avoid noise interference change your cell phone setting to vibration mode please don't interrupt our esteemed speaker only members of audience who identify themselves openly will be allowed to ask question no anonymous questioners please questions are moderated through the chat room please be precise and specific in asking a question and don't send comments in the form of a monologue we are recording this event and it's also being live streamed on our youtube channel and it will be available later on on our website as well i would request our audience not to share their screens because this causes interference without further ado it's my great pleasure and honor to invite ambassador professor veena sikri to deliver this distinguished lecture madam sikri please yeah. namaste uh, good evening uh, welcome uh, to all your friends i must thank uh, dr atindyan ji for inviting me to deliver the uh, distinguished lecture of the csa this saturday uh, for the second time and i i feel honored and privileged uh, to be part of the csa i've always enjoyed uh, participating in the meetings and listening to the excellent talks uh, that are arranged by dr atijan ji with such regularity and such tremendous uh, relevance and enthusiasm to the events of the day um i i thank you in particular dr atijan ji for inviting me to talk on uh, bangladesh Demo democracy challenges and strategic concerns uh it's a very important time we are facing all facing a very interesting and important time uh in bangladesh we are looking carefully to see what is happening um and certainly at this point uh to exchange views with uh, all colleagues uh, uh from the csa and all others uh, who would be joining today's meeting it is a great honor and privilege um i was high commissioner in bangladesh um, for 3 years from 2003 to 2006 as dr atijan just said it was in itself a very tumultuous time and i can explain uh, some of the issues that were there at that time as we go along but in the beginning let's look at the democratic challenges uh, facing bangladesh and why is it that we are talking in terms of uh, democracy challenges i think um a uh, bangladesh we have to compare first of all our own subcontinent as bangladesh pakistan india we all know the historic um, uh, liberation war of 1971 which brought bangladesh its independence and its freedom but perhaps we don't uh, quite realize that the trigger the final straw uh, for the liberation war of bangladesh uh, for the uh, the move the push uh, the 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 determination of the people of bangladesh to have independence was an election result 
So it was in 1970 that uh, actually this was possibly the first uh, general election held in Pakistan, in the then Pakistan combining East and West. Before that, actually, um, Pakistan had not held any elections, contrary to India, where we'd had regularly elections beginning with the first general election. But in Pakistan, there were two indirect elections. And then 1970, they decided to have the first uh, general election, the first parliamentary election, universal voting rights. Now, in this election, these were won fairly and squarely by uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. And he, uh, leading the Iwami League, uh, not only won the the absolutely almost 100% of the seats in East Pakistan, but also in the overall assembly, he had a majority. So clearly, he was to be the prime minister of Pakistan. Now, this was uh, opposed uh, by uh, by Bhutto, by Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, uh, who headed the People's Pakistan pa uh, Party, PPP, Pakistan People's Party, and also by then Yahya Khan, although Yahya Khan was a kind of intermediary between the two. Short point, the assembly was never called, and when talks were being held in uh, in Dhaka, in, in you know, to actually how to convene the assembly, how would it be uh, with uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto giving all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, models, okay, you be in East Pakistan, I'll be in West Pakistan, so on and so forth, Awami League in East Pakistan, PPP in West Pakistan. While all this was hap happening, Yahya Khan broke the talks, left, and Operation Searchlight began, which launched uh, the direct attack, genocidal attack on the people of Bangladesh, leading to the liberation war and ultimately freedom of um, the people of Bangladesh and creation of a new state. Now, it's important to remember this because Bangladesh was born because they wanted democratic freedom. They struggled against uh, the government of West Pakistan, against the government of overall Pakistan, but based in West Pakistan. They struggled against the government because they were not getting their free rights. They were not allowed to have uh, Bengali as a second language of uh, Pakistan. Uh, you know, even works by Ravindra Tagore, music by Ravindra Tagore was banned. Uh, you know, they were, they were even economically, they were they felt they were being treated as a colonial part of Pakistan because uh, all the raw material exports were majority from uh, East Pakistan, but the money was going to West Pakistan and not coming for the development of East Pakistan. Six-point program was created. So Pak uh, East Pakistan, Bangladesh, was very conscious of the need for democratic freedoms and rights. This is an important point to remember because this is the universal demand of the people of Bangladesh. Until today, it remains that way. They want democracy. They will not stand for any other form of government expect, except democracy. And the first thing that Sheikh Mujib Rahman did at the end of the liberation war was to start the process of creating a constitution of Bangladesh. And this was uh, in 1972, this process was completed, uh, was adopted, and uh, elections were held in Bangladesh in 19. 73, which was, uh, you know, just about a year after the return um, of uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman to Dhaka after the war. Now, the principles of the Bangladesh con constitution, what were the four pillars of the constitution of Bangladesh? Nationalism, socialism, democracy, and secularism. These are the four pillars, and it is the uh, the continuing dedication to these four pillars. Although there have been amendments in the constitution, but secularism has been brought back, even though now Islam is a state religion, but freedom to practice all religions is there. So I think this whole uh, process of um, uh, commit commitment to democracy was cruelly interrupted by the assassination of uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and after that military rule for 15 years, uh, you know, first by President Zia Rahman and then by President Ershad. But the important point is that despite that, the return to democracy in 1991, this is the vital point that even after 15 years of um, uh, military rule, the people of Bangladesh never forgot their commitment to democracy. And in 1991, it was the two political, major political parties, Awami League and the BNP, which came together at that time, you know, uh, uh, Sheikh Hasina and um, Khalda Zia, they came together to say that we want to go back to democracy and we want uh, dictatorship to end, military dictatorship to end. Now, they came together for this. They were welcomed by the people of Bangladesh in their efforts and President Ershad was forced to step down. It was a remarkable example of a country going back to democracy peacefully without any bloodshed at all. 
And uh, in fact, President Ashad later, I asked him how he agreed to this uh, because he was the military dictator. And he said, yes, he didn't want bloodshed. He didn't want civilian bloodshed. He knew there would be. And so he agreed to this. So now um, in 91, they started the process of democratic elections. Uh, all over again. There were elections in 91 and in 1996. In 96, they uh, brought in the system of a caretaker government because, uh, you know, it was this feeling and here the differences between the two political parties start coming in and uh, uh, both the parties eventually agree to do a constitutional amendment and allow uh, a caretaker government, a non-party government for three months to conduct the elections and uh, allow the elected, duly elected party to come in. Now, this was again a unique uh, example, a unique methodology, I would say, to have, again, to assure uh, uh, free and fair elections, but also to get the confidence of the people that it would be free and fair elections. Now, this um, this uh, system of uh, credit government worked uh, for some time. It was there for the 96 elections, for the 2001 elections. But then in 2006, in fact, that was the time when I was there and, you know, everybody was looking forward to the next election. Um, uh, Actually, it was Begum Khaldazia, who was the prime minister at the time, who started tweaking the system of forming the caretaker government. The caretaker government was to be led by the immediately past retired uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court. And, um, and uh, Begum Khaldazia tweaked that constitutional rule by, by extending the date of retirement of judges of Bangladesh, and which meant that the person who would have been uh, the caretaker chief was not and somebody else, etc. That broke down the confidence uh, between the uh, political parties and there was great opposition. And in the end, uh, Begum Khaldazia just decided and declared that the then president, Yajuddin Ahmed, would be the caretaker chief. Now, this was a great... Um, a uh, blow once again to the democratic structures of Bangladesh, and it meant that um, it, it meant that uh, there was a breakdown really because Awami League did not accept that. Nobody was accepting that, and then you had in January two thousand and seven once again the prospects, or shall I say, the you know looming possibility of army rule because uh, you even had the UN putting out a statement that if the army is going to take in charge, it might. Uh, challenge uh, Bangladesh participation in uh, peacekeeping operations. And then at that point, we had a situation where a new caretaker chief was brought in, President uh, who was uh, Fakuzin uh, Ahmed, and uh, the President Yajuddin Ahmed stepped down, and it was on track. This was the army-backed caretaker government, which ruled for two years. There was a possibility, there was a question mark, that would the army stay on? Would they allow elections to be held? But the people, again, it became very clear they were not going to be happy without any electoral process. Uh, they wanted free and fair elections. And so you went back again in 2008, elections were held and Sheikh Hasina came in uh, with a huge majority. And since 2009, she has been the prime minister, three terms completed and looking at a possible fourth term. Now, this has been going on. But in the meanwhile, something happened that, of course, the BNP's demand was always that they wanted to go back to the caretaker government. But the, the constitutional process, the judicial process uh, came in to say that the process of a caretaker government led by a non-party system, non-elected prime minister, was unconstitutional in terms of the constitution of Bangladesh because Bangladesh constitution insisted on parliamentary form of government, a unitary parliamentary form of government. They don't have a federation, it's a unitary uh, parliament. And uh, this parliament has to be, uh, this um, process has to be led by an elected prime minister. And so the process of caretaker uh, government was declared null and void and against the constitution. And it virtually meant no longer, that for the last three elections now, uh, 2009, after that 2014, 2018, and now the next election uh, in Jan on January 7, 2024, have all been uh, by the government remaining in power, by the prime minister remaining in power. And I've given you this background because this is the key point today, that can the elections be held um, uh, under anything other than the prime minister, <clears throat> the elected prime minister, uh, leading the government into elections? Of course, you have all the, uh, you know, uh, 
controls that you cannot announce any major schemes and this and that, all that is there, but the prime minister remains in position. This is what the BNP is opposing, and this is what is leading the BNP to say that they will not take part in the next elections. So far, this is the position. Although the process of nominating of candidates is going on, and November 30th, five days from now, is the last date for withdrawal of nominations. And so we are in a very crucial phase because the BNP is still um, insisting that they will not take part in the election. We know that uh, the US government has evinced keen interest in the process of having uh, free and fair elections. And only very recently, a few days ago, uh, there was a letter written by Donald Liu uh, to, uh, from the State Department uh, to the three party leaders, uh, Sheikh Hasina, Begum Khalda Zia, and uh, the leader of the Jatiyo Party, uh, you know, uh, saying that there should be unconditional talks and there must be free and fair elections. Now, as opposed to any of that happening, the election process has now started. Um, and, um, yeah, you know, the the uh, Prime Minister, I think that the, the Awami League has replied to that letter saying that the election process has started, but they are willing to have talks at any time uh, within the constitutional process. The election commissioner has also said that they are wanting more and more parties to participate. They would welcome full participation and they're prepared to have talks on this and also giving a hint that if there is, uh, you know, the demand for participation, then they would, um, would they? question mark, uh, even delay the election, the date of the elections. So I think this is a, a very important moment. But I would like to say at this point that we have to look at it at one side from the point of view of the constitutional process and whether you can go back to the caretaker government without am amending the constitution. That is no longer possible because there have been a, a decision by the judiciary, by the highest judiciary of Bangladesh on this factor. So uh, we, it is in one sense, looking at it from the outside, it is a standoff. And what would it mean for the elections of Bangladesh? We are now a process where I think Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina is meeting various uh, political party leaders. Uh, there was a statement in the last day or two saying that 26 uh, political parties have now said that they will uh, take part in the elections. Of course, the principal largest party is the Awami League. There are a number of other smaller parties. Um, uh, I think that at this moment, we have to uh, you know, look at this process from the point of view of the election process going on or it being interrupted. Unconditional talks would mean putting everything back on the agenda, saying, OK, we can talk about, um, uh, you know, bringing back the caretaker government. We can talk about Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina having to resign or hand over the reins of uh, government to uh, a, a non-elected group. Uh, you know, this is all something which uh, can be talked about when the electric, electoral process is not quite on. But it is on now. And I think that... In my view, this will go on. I don't see any change in it. I don't see the process being stopped at this point because it is already an election underway. And um, I think the best would be uh, for each party to make its own decisions on whether it would uh, like to participate or not. You know, the BNP, for example, in 2014, uh, they decided not to participate. And many people at that time said that if they had participated, they would probably have won that election because it was, you know, that kind. In 2018 elections, again, uh, BNP, uh, you know, about seven BNP people did get elected because they couldn't withdraw their uh, nominations in time. Um, uh, but then they've really not been participating so that it, they've not really been there. So I think that, um, uh, again, this year, the BNP has to make its own decision and uh, should look at the situation, uh, whether it whether it will participate or not. I would, you know, urge them to think seriously about it and consider whether they would, uh, uh, what they would like to decide. In the meanwhile, I would say from the side of the people of Bangladesh, the people of Bangladesh love their elections. They love going for elections. They love being participating. They love voting. And as you know, you know, it, it's very dynamic. And they also, uh, there is always a question, okay, should we vote for the incumbent person? Is there an anti-incumbency factor? All these issues are there. And then they look at what Prime Minister uh, Sheikh Hasina has done for the uh, country in the last 15 years. The Bangladesh economy is doing very well. They've had a consistent growth rate of 5% and above, sometimes 6%, even 7%. Uh, so there has been a considerable increase, improvement in the growth rate of Bangladesh. And um, uh, there has been a lot of improvement in many socioeconomic indications of Bangladesh, whether it is maternal mortality, infant mortality, uh, you know, social factors like education and literacy. Uh, the NGOs are very active on these social factors and things. So these these 
instances are very strong, very good. I'm sure the people would take that into account. But I'm, I'm sure the people also look at choices. So would they have the choice or would they not have the choice? There is a concern that if there are not uh, too many parties um, uh, participating, then the a low voter, voter turnout may set in because if you don't have a choice to vote, um, like in the, in the 2014 elections, the main thing was there were 153 candidates elected unopposed because there was the BNP had boycotted the election and uh, a candidate being elected unopposed is considered by some people as a deprivation of the right to vote, you know, because you want a choice, you want people to be there. But I think that... Um, if you look at democratic challenges, election is certainly one aspect of democratic challenges. But elections are a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for measurement of democracy. I think there are many other aspects of democracy that one has to look at, uh, uh, which is, you know, the functioning of the other branches of government. There's the executive, uh, there's the legislature, and there's a the judiciary. And there is the fourth estate, which is the media. So we have to look at all these aspects, functioning of all these aspects, when we look at democratic challenges in Bangladesh. And uh, of course, as in any robust democracy, there are always pros and cons. And some people will say, well, I think it's going fine. And Others will uh, pick a large number of uh, holes in the argument and say, no, look, the media is under, you know, there's the Digital Security Act. Some people, uh, you know, point to that to say that is the media really free to to um, uh, to talk about it, uh, talk about all issues um, under the judiciary. There is a promise of independence of the judiciary, but the final steps to that um, have not yet been uh, taken. So there are these pros and cons. But I would say that by and large, uh, compared to democratic countries in in every part of the world, uh, there is no perfect democracy. We all have some kind of flawed democracy, flaws of some kind or the other, which some may consider major or minor flaws. Um, but I think that the robustness of the people or their interest in democracy is an important factor and the robustness of the government that the government has been operating there has been economic growth uh, there have been vibrant uh, political and uh, economic uh, relations uh, of Bangladesh with all its neighbors so I think that uh, from this point of view I think Bangladesh is a good example of a functioning democracy. There should, I think, be a more robust dialogue, not right now when the election process has already been announced, but at all times between all parties to see how you can find a wire media. Now, this is an important point because otherwise in Bangladesh, as in many other democracies uh, around the world, you get this feeling of winner takes all mentality. You know that whoever wins the election says, oh, now I won the election. Now everything is mine and I will do what I like. And for the next five years, I can I can follow this process of doing what I like. Now, that is not uh, quite what uh, democracy is all about, because an opposition, uh, a strong opposition is an important important part of a democracy. And that's important. So the process, the means of ensuring a dynamic opposition is also part of democracy. So these also are subjects on which uh, uh, talks should be held really. But as against that, I must point to the fact that this should all be done without violence. So now, as recently as October 28th, when there was a democratic um, rallies allowed in Dhaka uh, by the uh, BNP and some other parties, violence came in. You know, buses were burnt, a policeman died, uh, uh, there was a breakdown of the law and order situation for a while in some of the areas. So that, again, is, is, is a very big setback. And I think in 2014 and uh, even in 2018, this business of, you know, resorting to violence, having blockades, having buns, burning buses. In fact, in, I remember in 2014, even, you know, buses were burnt even when the people were inside them and there was a lot of loss of life and so on. So uh, I think all this should be avoided and this question of of having a democratic structure, which means achieving your results uh, through non-violent dialogue is an important aspect of democracy and is an indication of a mature democracy. So I think this is an important aspect to be to come in uh, and this should be brought in, um, uh, you know, at all times borne in mind. But on the other hand, Bangladesh is um, inviting all international observers to come and observe the elections. Uh, the election commission is functioning daily and uh, issuing a lot of uh, guidelines and so on, doing its, the work that it should be doing. And there are going to be international observers um, at the elections in uh, January. Uh, and um, 
I think that in previous elections also, the international observers have by and large given a clean chit uh, to the election process. Uh, you know, with some exceptions here and there, they've said, yes, fine, the elections were held, you know, they were democratic elections. So I think that keeping all this in mind, one can certainly look forward to the 12th parliamentary election in Bangladesh, uh, which is coming up now in uh, in January, and hope that it will be um, a peaceful process and will bring a result that the people of Bangladesh want. Uh, India has very good relations with the people of Bangladesh, and we have a close uh, uh, relationship based on mutual benefit, mutual trust, and mutual respect. And uh, India's uh, neighborhood first foreign policy has uh, given us uh, the chance of attaching very high priority to the development of relations with our neighboring countries. And I think with Bangladesh today, the way in which uh, the relationship has developed is a very good example of how good neighborly relations uh, can and should develop uh, between uh, uh, neighboring countries. Again, always based on dialogue and solving all problems through dialogue and understanding. I mean, between India and Bangladesh, uh, for example, if you look at uh, the um, uh, you know the two big factors land boundary and maritime boundary uh, there were problems there were these enclaves and so on which were there and which had been left over of the process of independence dating back to 1947 but which was then solved and signed off on exchange of populations took place in a very peaceful democratic manner with no difficulties of any kind the option was given to the people living there you want to stay on and become citizen of the place where you're living it's fine you want to go back uh, to the other side that's also fine it happened in a peaceful way and it was a very good example of a land boundary being solved peacefully similarly with the maritime boundary you know we had a, a, a difficult situation on the maritime boundary with bangladesh and in the end it went into arbitration i think bangladesh took it for arbitration international arbitration but when the international arbitration results came and that was when Prime Minister Modi had already become the Prime Minister. There was a lot of talk whether no matter what the arbitration result would be, whether India would accept or Bangladesh would accept or would there be a further problem. But in the end, when the result came, India and the government of India decided to accept it in total without any difficulty. The maritime problem was solved and that is another good example of good neighbourly relations. I'm saying all this because I'm coming to the second part of the talk, which is on strategic concerns. Uh, and... Um, I think when you look at these, uh, uh, this aspect of the talk of strategic concerns, we have to recognize that Bangladesh is indeed strategically a very important country, a very important uh, part of the uh, global committee of nations. And I think it is very important to recognize that, uh, you know, Bangladesh uh, uh, can play a very important role. Now, Bangladesh is at the head of the Bay of Bengal. It has a crucial uh, security aspect, strategic aspect in terms of its role in the, in the um, in, in Indo-Pacific. And I think here is something that Bangladesh has to uh, take uh, real cognizance of. And uh, Bangladesh, I think, is very aware of this. And in fact, they recently issued a, a, a white paper, a strategic paper on the Indo-Pacific outlook, which was very well formulated, very well drafted, fully aware of the strategic consequences of every decision they make and wanting to develop their uh, uh, diplomatic relations uh, very clearly in a very friendly and positive manner with all countries of the world. Friendship towards all, malice towards none is the uh, motto that uh, Sheikh Mujib had given to the nation. And this is still followed by, by Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. And uh, she is very clear on this. And she has, in that context, um, taken every effort uh, to maintain very good relations with India and other neighbors and solve every problem in a direct peaceful manner. Now, in addition to its uh, strategic, um, uh, you know, concerns as, as in the maritime zone in the in Indo-Pacific. We also have other strategic concerns. For example, you know, China is very active and China is not really a South Asian power. China is a North Asian power, north of the Himalayas and south of the Himalayas. But China does tend to uh, focus a lot on developing its uh, 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 relations or strongly developing its relations with India's neighbors. And sometimes we see uh, things happening which, um, um, which, which lead us to have discussions with some of our neighbors. But I think that Bangladesh has been quite um, uh, interested in this aspect, concerned about this aspect, aware of this aspect. And so they are able to, uh, to um, uh, 
discuss this out. You know, this is the important point. It's not that you will not have differences with your neighbors. You will have. There always will be. If you're two neighbors living in the same, you know, as we call it, mohalla community in any part of the world, you always have some differences with the neighbors. But the question is how you solve those. You solve it peacefully. You solve it by discussion. You solve it by, you know, uh, generating friendship and understanding. Or you solve it by, uh, you know, um, less peaceful means. That is the question. India has always given focus on solving it peacefully. And I think that Bangladesh's strategic importance will increase because it's a, it's, it's a comparatively small country, but with a huge population. So the density of population of Bangladesh is very high. So that is a very important concern uh, because very large number of people. So you have a lot of pressure of people uh, leaving Bangladesh, wanting to go and work in other countries. And the conditions for that is always one of the issues. Uh, then uh, environmentally, Bangladesh is I think uh, very worried, very severely challenged, I would say, because uh, the being, uh, you know, the largest riverine uh, estuary deltaic region of the world, um, it is greatly affected by climate change and the rising sea levels. So rising sea levels uh, pose the single largest challenge uh, to Bangladesh. Um, and so they are very worried that they should be able to uh, uh, meet those challenges and overcome them and meet them in keeping with the interests of the people of Bangladesh and uh, keeping mind, in mind the continued growth of the people of Bangladesh. So I think that um, uh, this is an important aspect and Bangladesh themselves have been playing a very important role in environmental for forums and uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has been cha chairing some of these uh, groups uh, and she's been very, very dynamic on that. So I think that that uh, this aspect is a very important one, strategic one. I think that climate change is a strategic issue and has to be uh, dealt with in, in uh, close cooperation. So I think that uh, these aspects are something that uh, Bangladesh um, uh, is taking care of. The economic relations, uh, Bangladesh's economic growth depends a lot on its exports. And in ready-made garments, they are the single largest exporter. Uh, I think after China, they're the single largest ready-made garments exporters. And America is one of the largest markets. So I think here we have a very interesting situation where, uh, you know, you have a uh, a uh, question of um, America uh, raising issues uh, with Bangladesh, but Bangladesh uh, knowing and appreciating that uh, economically their relationship with America is very important. It's the single largest destination for uh, Bangladesh exports of ready-made garments and um, is likely to remain so. So I think that Bangladesh is also trying now to, to have a uh, dialogue, uh, talks with America and, uh, uh, you know, bring them on board because if there are differences, they should be discussed and explained and, and understood. So I think this is an aspect that is there. Uh, I think another issue in Bangladesh, which is of concern to many people, it is a, a democratic secular country, but the forces of religious fundamentalism, uh, the growth of radicalization is an issue that Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has herself spoken about and taken very important steps uh, to combat it, uh, to, to um, see that how you can keep the forces in check. Certainly her government, her police, um, her intelligence agencies, they do keep a very close track and they uh, have clamped down. They've had, like there was the Holy Artisan Bakery attack and there were others, you know, there was the uh, Jamaat and Mujahid in Bangladesh, which was... Um, composed of people who had gone to fight in Afghanistan and when they came back, they, they uh, you know... Um, started the religious groups there. So that has been a huge uh, challenge uh, for Bangladesh. It's a continuing challenge for Bangladesh. It's something which concerns all Bangladesh's neighbors as well. So this is a big issue that they have to look at, a big strategic concern uh, for Bangladesh and uh, all the neighbors. And uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina does, does, does work closely. She is in touch with many of the Islamist parties. There are a large number of smaller parties, but the jamaat e islami the single, single largest party, is today uh, not in a, it's not going to be standing in the elections. The Supreme Court of Bangladesh just gave a verdict recently that uh, uh, they have not yet solved the issue because the constitution of the jamaat e islami as a political party is not in congruence with the constitution of Bangladesh as a nation. So they have to give primacy to the constitution of Bangladesh and not to the constitution of the political 
political party which may recognize uh, religion as a primary factor. And because of this, uh, Jamaat-e Islami is not able to fight the elections as a political party because there is talk, of course, that they will the candidates will go and join some of the other political parties. In fact, in the last time when BNP was in power, 2001-2006, uh, the Jamaat was their political ally and they had many important portfolios in the government. Uh, so this is uh, one of the issues uh, that will certainly be coming up. I think another strategic concern, I would say, is with the Rohingya issue, uh, where you had, and that is because Myanmar, you know, Bangladesh shares a, a border with just two countries, India and Myanmar. I mean, the, in, the Indian border is about the largest uh, more than almost 4,000 kilometers, and there's a small three to 400 kilometer border with uh, Myanmar. Uh, but uh, through that border, we had the problem of the Rohingyas coming in very large numbers, and about a million Rohingyas are today <clears throat> under uh, refugee status in Bangladesh, and um, they are staying in the Chittagong Hill Tracks region, and some islands, the Bashar Shah has also been. Uh, 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 you know, buildings have been put up there to allow the refugees to stay there, but it remains a huge challenge uh, for the government of Bangladesh in terms of the resources required, in terms of the environmental challenge of having so many people living in, in uh, you know, open air refugee camps, and in, in terms of solving this issue, uh, you know, about the Myanmar government, their talks with the Myanmar government, but as we know, the situation in Myanmar itself is very difficult today. So this is another strategic issue which is of great uh, importance and which we uh, constantly discuss with Bangladesh. But Bangladesh is a very, uh, uh, you know, another important, I would say, positive strategic aspect of Bangladesh is thinking that they attach a lot of importance to, to regional cooperation regional and sub-regional cooperation. So even if SARC is not having many meetings, India and Bangladesh and other neighbors are very active in the BBIN format, which is the Bangladesh, Bhutan, India and Nepal uh, format, where we say, all right, let us do sub-regional cooperation. So we have uh, sub-regional talks on connectivity, we have sub-regional talks on uh, uh, you know roads and waterway sharing and um, uh, rail connectivity, sharing of electricity, power transmission through the countries. So we have a lot of uh, uh, ideas of sub-regional cooperation. And in fact, that is an aspect which is very welcomed by the people of Bangladesh as well. They love this idea of sub-regional cooperation. And uh, so with, with Bhutan, with Nepal, India has worked out very good uh, three-way uh, transmission of electricity, which is, you know, a great important factor uh, which has worked out very well it's happening in europe and other countries but to do it in south asia for the first time so successfully has directly brought economic growth to many regions of bangladesh uh, that earlier could not have economic growth and it is now uh, you know it's going to happen with nepal and bhutan as well so i think um, I've, I've explained to you the broad uh, parameters of strategic concerns uh, but since i've been speaking now for about half an hour a little more uh, if you agree dr Tijen, should I stop at this point and, and look for questions? Uh, if you have any more material to present, kindly go ahead and do so before we start with the questions. Okay, all right. So um, I think that um, if we look at this issue, uh, my final portion, uh, my final part of my talk will be to bring together this issue of democratic challenges, democracy challenges and strategic concerns. I mean, these are two important aspects because, um, uh, you know, you want the strategic concerns to be um, uh, looked at to be kept in mind and they're there all the time it's not that they go away it's not that you can stop thinking about them at any time but we do know also that if these strategic concerns are to be met are to be dealt with uh, democracy is the best form of government uh, that 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 should be there. So we are always very keen that as a very important neighbor, as India's most important neighbor, that Bangladesh uh, should have a democratic and stable government and it should be prosperous. So the economic growth of Bangladesh, economic development of Bangladesh is a very important uh, factor for us. And we have done um, a lot in our bilateral talks uh, with Bangladesh to make sure that the economic growth goes on unhindered. And in fact, I would I would just give you a small example. You know, uh, when I was high commissioner there, there's always been an issue that Bangladesh's um, exports to India are far, far lower than India's exports to Bangladesh. And we've always tried to work very hard on increasing 
improving Bangladesh's exports to India. So when I was there, it was barely a little more than $50 million Bangladesh exports to India. So I had made it my uh, kind of one of my goals to double this and to make it $100 million exports of Bangladesh to India, which we did, we were able to do. But today, Bangladesh's exports to India are $2 billion US dollars. So this has been a huge growth and a huge factor in uh, uh, promoting the prosperity of Bangladesh and economic growth in Bangladesh because you have a ready-made market. And India has done this by uh, giving uh, almo almost free, uh, duty-free access uh, to Bangladesh for its goods on the Indian market. And um, there is just a very short negative list of you know, things like alcohol and tobacco and so on, which uh, don't come. But otherwise, every good from Bangladesh comes in uh, duty-free. And this has meant a tremendous economic growth in uh, 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 Bangladesh. And consistent and persistent economic growth. So this is a very strong factor and we would like this economic cooperation uh, to, to, uh, to grow and to develop. Now also we have a very strong um, interaction people to people. About a million and a half uh, visas are given to Bangladesh citizens every year. And in addition to that, of course, many people get long term visa, especially those who are doing business. So you can see uh, and you can appreciate that the interaction between India and Bangladesh is 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 so intense. People come from uh, Bangladesh to India for medical treatment, for trade and investment, uh, for students, they come as students, they come for pilgrimage. And in every way, I mean, you know, in, in, in Calcutta, for example, in Kolkata, there are hospitals which, which have special, you know, facilities for Bangladesh to uh, uh, patients looking after them, making sure they're well, uh, you know, treated and their uh, ailments are given high priority. So all this is there to make sure that Bangladesh Bangladesh is able to grow in prosperity and smoothness. So this is a, a very important aspect of the interaction that we have uh, uh, developed with Bangladesh. It's a strategic uh, aspect, and we are now we are now developing the connectivity links uh, between India and Bangladesh. And you can send goods by um, you know Mongla port in the south of Bangladesh. It's just a day's sailing from Kolkata. And if you reach Mongla port, you can put put your book, uh, goods on a container in a container on the barge or on a uh, ship and send it by river right to the northeast of uh, India. And of course, all these logistics uh, arrangements are almost invariably with Bangladesh companies. So it is their companies who are doing all this and prospering and developing. And of course, long before India gets access to Northeast India, it is the Bangladesh companies who are equally getting access to Northeast India and they are uh, developing their uh, trade, developing their exchanges and, you know, really doing very well. So now with these connectivity uh, developments, you have a situation where investment in Bangladesh is going up because you can come and invest in Bangladesh and if the connectivity links are good, you can uh, then your whatever you make can have access to the world market, access to the Indian market, access to Northeast market, access to Southeast Asia, and in short, it really leads to the prosperity of uh, both countries and the region as well. So I think in this context, we are, we are um, uh, you know, really trying to work hard and to overcome any uh, problems that may be there from both sides. If you see now they are integrated check posts at the border. So, you know, people can, uh, uh, you know, come and trade and they will be able to be, uh, you know, let through easily without any delays. Goods can come in easily. Uh, customs posts are integrated uh, with the, the rest of the facilities and there are even border hearts, there are border markets markets uh, which are there for uh, goods to be exchanged at the border. So I think that uh, these aspects show that we bring together the strategic concerns of continuous prosperity in Bangladesh together with uh, democracy and stability. I think the, the democratic form of government is, um, in my view, the most stable form of government because it allows a peaceful exchange or peaceful change of governments at the end of five years, or if a government is going to stay on, a peaceful way for a government to stay on. And it gives confidence uh, to the people of that country that uh, whatever we have done, we have had elections and the government has stayed on or there has been a change, it has happened in a peaceful way. It gives a lot of strength to the people who can then look for peace and stability. And I think that the more Bangladesh is growing and prospering, the more the people of Bangladesh want 
continuing peace and stability. There's a strong middle class. And as we know that a strong middle class is the biggest factor for uh, peace and stability and continuing prosperity. And this is what is happening in Bangladesh. A good system of education, good number of universities. People go abroad for studying. They come back to their country and work. So this has been um, a, a big factor for the peaceful growth of Bangladesh, even in the last 15 years with Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina at the helm. Uh, you know, this has been a, a, a great factor. And I hope that this is going to be able to strengthen its peaceful development, its democratic development, and its strategic integration uh, with all countries of the world. So I think I'll stop at this point and maybe look for questions. Thank you, Ambassador Sikri, for such a fascinating and very uh, detailed uh, lecture. In fact, it is so detailed that pretty much all the questions probably have already been answered. However, for sake of discussion, I will definitely uh, put forth a few questions. And when we come to strategic concerns, as I mentioned, that the coup that led to murder of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and his entire family, uh, and it was in an era when interfering in other countries was the forte of certain intelligence agencies. Uh, and it is stated that it is pro it was probably inspired by a Western uh, country's uh, intelligence agency. We are seeing similar kind of interference when European Union tries to interfere in the current Bangladesh elections. And similarly, the United States ambassador to Bangladesh has a sit down with the prime minister of Bangladesh asking to consider the caretaker government. And also when one of the parties, the opposition party, Bangladesh National Party says that their strongest ally is United States ambassador to Bangladesh. So from a strategic point of view, this external meddling in the electoral process of a democratic country. Is that acceptable? Um, <laughs> thank you. That's a very interesting and a very direct question. Um, I, I agree with you that external interference should not be allowed at all. I fully agree with you because, um, you know, internally, whatever the people decide, it should be a decision of their own. And it's only if the in people of that country have the confidence that this is their decision, then you have the uh, force for stability. But if you think that changes in the name of democracy can be made from outside, then it does not bode well for democratic uh, challenges in that country because then you know that anytime you want you can bring in a change from outside and it will be 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 uh, tolerated by the people i think increasingly the people of bangladesh are very concerned on this factor and uh, they they constantly discuss it among themselves and they see now what you said about uh, you know the murder of sheikh mujib that was indeed a very very um, dastardly act cruel i mean to assassinate a whole family like that and and quite rightly and you know not only they assassinated but then we also know that later on under president Zia Rahman indemnity was given to those people and some of them were sent off as ambassadors and some of them we know are living abroad and it is only after Sheikh Hasina came to power uh, for the first time between 96 and 2001 and then subsequently after uh, 2008 or 2009 uh, it's only then that this whole question of war crime trials this whole question of um, you know who were the people who were in favor of the freedom of Bangladesh liberation of Bangladesh and who were the people who caused the death by assassination of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. These uh, issues have been have come up. Uh, the uh, trials of those people who were involved in the assassination have been held. Uh, death sentences have been given. Uh, but some of these people, as we know, are living abroad. And the countries where they are living, US and Canada, are certainly one of them. And they are uh, uh, one of the factors there uh, for uh, differences between uh, Bangladesh and uh, USA and Canada on these issues. And I think that uh, these should be discussed directly. I think I think it's it's one more reason for Bangladesh and uh, USA to have good relations and Bangladesh and Canada to have good relations and to be able to sit down and discuss these issues. Uh, because certainly um, 
for the people of Bangladesh, it's important. And I would say, I, I'll give an example of the war crimes trial. It was, it was opposed by many countries, even uh, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia. The, you know, many people opposed the war crime trial. The, why, oh, so many decades have passed, so why do you want to have the war crime trial and, you know, leave it? But Sheikh Hasira did not give up. And she held the war crimes trial. The people were given the sentence and those who received the death sentence uh, are no longer with us. But she, she did that. And she, that gave the people of Bangladesh a lot of confidence in her. And in fact, I would say that even she changed uh, the whole assessment of why the, uh, why the liberation of Bangladesh had to take place. Why did it take place? Uh, why was it impossible for East Pakistan to live uh, with West Pakistan, you know, as part of the same country? And this, you know, which... Uh, even when I was there, it was a totally different interpretation. And there were a lot of question marks and innuendos about the liberation war. But Sheikh Hasina has brought about uh, a clear understanding accepted by the people on what it was. Who were the people who did not favor the liberation of Bangladesh? And why are they still, you know, uh, playing that role? So this is where the role of some of the parties uh, comes in that um, are they, uh, you know, uh, wanting to continue Bangladesh with Bangladesh? Are they in favor of the continuing independence of Bangladesh? What will be their foreign policy? All these issues come up. But I would say that um, Sheikh Hasina has been able to withstand these pressures very well. And this, I think, is her strategic strength, that she has been able to stand these pressures. And uh, the people have are basically with her on that. You know, you don't see anybody writing in the newspapers or talking about something which is not, uh, you know, supporting what she did on these issues. And what you said about the European Union also. Now, I, I did mention the economic aspect, which becomes linked at some point with the strategic aspect, whether it is the USA or whether it is the EU. These are very important economic partners for Bangladesh. So um, uh, are they going to be able to uh, solve these problems uh, or will it affect the economic relationship between the EU and Bangladesh or the USA and Bangladesh? Now, this is another point on which I think the US, uh, Bangladesh has to have a continuous dialogue and has to make, you know, their point of view uh, brought about very clearly. Because again, you know, the um, impression in many of these countries and the write-ups in many of the papers is of a different kind. You know, you get an impression that is uh, Sheikh Hasina a democratic leader? Is she being democratic in what she is doing? There is a there are many newspapers in Bangladesh, and some of them are supporting her, some of them are opposing her. So um, you know, it it shows that the democratic dialogue is there. So I would say yes, I agree with you that there have been these terrible instances in their um, in their history, and I think the way to overcome them is to maintain your own economic independence and to also go for good relations uh, with all countries, but to maintain the democratic structure. I think this is the most important. If the democratic structure weakens in Bangladesh, you will have a lot of problems and serious ones. And this will bring a strategic, a whole new dimension to strategic issues with Bangladesh. So, Ambassador Sikri, Bangladesh's foreign minister, A.K. Abdul Momin, made a statement. And I will read the statement. Canada must not be a hub of all the murderers. The murderers can go to Canada and take shelter and they can have a wonderful life while those they kill, uh, their relatives are suffering. That is in response to Canada's refusal to extradite a self-confessed assassin of Mujibur Rahman, Noor Chowdhury. Any comments on can Canadian government stance? Yeah. Well, you know, I agree. I think this is a, a, a very serious matter. And I think that the Canadian government must take it on board. And this statement that you have referred to by uh, Foreign Minister of Bangladesh actually was made in the context of the uh, differences of opinion that India is having with Canada on the question of the assassination of, uh, you know, Hadeep Singh Major and uh, the tremendous uh, way in which the uh, Prime Minister of Canada made a statement in Parliament and so on and has been and had been refusing to extradite uh, Mr. Major and send him to India because for all the terrorist acts that he'd done. So even the international, um, even the uh, uh, red corner notice had been in, in 
you know, Interpol had issued a red corner notice for uh, Mr. Nijar, but still the Canadian government had, had not been. So I think, you know, this is a matter for the Canadian government to introspect. They call themselves a democracy and you're talking about democracy in other countries. But what about within your own country? And I think that one of the things that has happened in Canada after uh, the long discussions and very wide coverage in Bangladesh of what is happening with India, these issues are uh, coming to the forefront. And people there did not know so much about it. They were not aware. And they were not aware that, you know, there are these uh, people who the Indian government had wanted to be extradited, but were refusing, the, the Canadian government was refusing to extradite them. There is now talk again about the Kanishka Air, bomb, Air India flight, which was bombed, uh, and so many people died. Hundreds of Canadian citizens died, many of them of Indian origin. And again, no action was taken. There was really no kind of, a, you know, very perfunctory kind of inquiry, and there was no punishment of any kind. But the people of Canada are now becoming aware of it. So there is a question to look at democratic traditions in all countries. Democracy means a constant awareness, a constant care to, to make sure that uh, the people know what is happening and uh, follow it up consistently. So, Ambassador Sikri, while talking about democracy, there is perception that the current administration in the United States is kind of not supporting the current government in Bangladesh. And there have been a number of instances, and, and one of that instance was White House Summit of Democracies. And ironically, Pakistan was invited to that summit, but Bangladesh was not invited to that summit. Any comments on that? Um, I I did note that, yes, that uh, Bangladesh was not invited. There have been two democracy summits and uh, Pakistan has invited to both. And I think as it happened, Pakistan did not go. I think they themselves did not even attend. But um, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, democracy is one is where there is a democracy. Sometimes you have hundreds of years of democracy. But the one is where the government and the people are trying their best and working every which way possible to strengthen democratic traditions. So both need to be encouraged thoroughly. And uh, I, I think that, you know, where in Pakistan, I began by talking about elections in Pakistan. And we know that they didn't even hold elections till seven, 1970, which had disastrous outcomes in, in terms of the liberation of Bangladesh. And then after that, they had elections in seven, 1977 and then I think 1988. And Actually, after that, no single government has completed its full term. And there's always, you know, the defense forces which come in and step in and something happens. So I, I think that, uh, you know, the the um, interest in democracy today are uh, a universal concern of the people remaining in, uh, in that country and education levels are vital. But even if you don't have high education level, it's the awareness of your right to vote that is a very important uh, factor. So I said it's one of the important uh, preconditions of democracy may not be a sufficient, but at least it's there as a necessary condition. So I think that that um, uh, these kind of uh, issues where you don't invite Bangladesh and you invite Pakistan, it, this should be discussed as well. And I think there should be, you know, um, uh, pointers that uh, that political differences are best overcome through discussions and democracy. And I think uh, Bangladesh on its own also is trying. I, I, I did see that there were some discussions with the American government, but perhaps maybe that started them a year earlier or so, it wouldn't have been like that. And I think also the BNP government has now started because they really thought that there would be some change in the uh, situation regarding the caretaker government. But suddenly they know, oh my God, the elections are two months away and now we must, you know, so you have had a flurry of pressure coming in from, the, from America and American uh, uh, senior uh, representatives of the State Department and so on, uh, which were not there earlier, you know, everything was going in. We, we saw that when uh, President Biden was there at the G20 summit in New Delhi, and he met Sheikh Hasina there, and uh, he was taking a selfie with her. And, you know, that itself, uh, they had a, a brief discussion. So I, I think, again, it is meetings like that, interactions like that, where both sides can explain their point of view. And I think in, in democracy, it is the... Um, lack of arrogance which is very important it's a humble approach uh, approach that you're depending on the people so let's go to them and see that you know they are uh, satisfied with what we are doing and every student every individual every villager every farmer every corporate structure every corporate person must be 
must have that sense of participation. There are problems, there are, uh, you know, misdemeanors, uh, lack of action. The judiciary should be strong enough to tackle them. The executive should be free. There should be a non-politicized bureaucracy, uh, you know. But in every country, you have problems. I mean, in, in, in America, the bureaucrats change every time there's a change in administration. You know, there's so many posts change. So in that sense, you have almost by definition a politicized bureaucracy. So <clears throat> in other countries, in other democratic countries, the, the bureaucrats don't change, but you can still have a politicized bureaucracy where, you know, the, the uh, bureaucrats are more concerned about the political powers than actually doing things on the ground to help the people or implement projects and so on. So democracies have problems. But the strategic concerns of the world, the discussions, the outcomes can only work if we push towards democracy more and more and instill the values of democracy in every individual through the education system. Uh, otherwise, it will always be a crisis. So coming to the strategic concerns, China has invested some money in Chittagong port. And as you know, China has trapped a number of countries in the debt trap as part of BRI. What is the relationship of BRI and Bangladesh and China? At this point, well, uh, China um, has always, as I say, I mentioned this briefly, that China has always been taking uh, uh, an enormous interest, far more than is normal, uh, in the countries in India's neighborhood. Whether it is Pakistan, where they have an all weather friendship, whether it is Maldives, where now the election has taken place and now again there's a change of government, whether it is Bangladesh, whether it is Nepal, whether it is Sri Lanka. So th they have been, but we have seen fairly clearly that the results have always been uh, a great deal of difficulty. Look at what happened in Sri Lanka. You know, Humble Tota Port, which is part of the BRI and created for the BRI, uh, then the moment um, uh, Sri Lanka couldn't pay, then, then uh, China took control and they were a 99 year lease and uh, really um, uh, Sri Lanka has lost control. Combined with that, when Sri Lanka had its economic crisis, China was not there to help. They didn't help Sri Lanka at all. So I would say that the credibility of the BRI has really suffered a huge hit. And this time at the latest um, BRI summit that China tried to organize, we saw uh, two important countries actually indicating their interest in withdrawing from the BRI. Italy in Europe, Italy is one of the important countries which has withdrawn from the BRI. In Asia, in Southeast Asia, it is Philippines. Uh, another important country which has uh, withdrawn from the BRI. So you, you do see that uh, China's, uh, uh, you know, forcing people into getting overexposure to debt, to Chinese debt, has led many of them into a debt trap and has produced product, has produced projects which really are of no use to the country concerned. I think China has built a project in Nepal, an airport at Pokhara Hotel, um, at Pokhara uh, Airport in the city of Pokhara. And really, it's it's not functioning at all. There is no way that the Nepal government can repay the debt uh, by using profits or money generated through the activity of Pokhara International Airport. So, you know, all countries are realizing this. And um, it's quite amazing that uh, President Xi Jinping had talked about BRI as his biggest contribution and his biggest contribution to, uh, you know, the new Silk Road and all kinds of things. But we know that after uh, less than 10 years that uh, he doesn't talk about it that much anymore, you know, and, and it's no longer one of his great successes. Even in Pakistan, the, the CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, I would say uh, is, is for all practical purposes lying in shambles. I mean, Gorar Port, and China is not able to even build up Gorar Port because there are always attacks on the Chinese and they're not welcome there. Uh, you know, the, uh, Pakistan has spent more money on defending or protecting the Chinese people who are working in in uh, in um, Pakistan. And um, there's no love lost between the people of Pakistan and these Chinese people who are living there. So that's another thing that, you know, these uh, BRI projects of the Chinese government have uh, led to high indebtedness. It doesn't give any um, uh, benefit to the people of that country in terms of employment, because very often China is bringing in its own labor. And, uh, you know, so that so there's absolutely no interaction uh, between uh, the people of that country getting jobs or benefiting from a project which China is bringing in. And uh, <clears throat> um, because of this lack of understanding, sometimes these projects are not welcome. So, uh, you know, a lot of the economic 
benefits, say for example, if you're building a railway line or a road, developing an infrastructure, and you say that the infrastructure, uh, you know, say the companies or the hotels, etc., being built along that road will also go to Chinese companies, then where is the interest of the, of the local businessman? Where is the interest of the local corporate figure? So I think that uh, uh, the BRI has proved to be uh, a real double-edged weapon, which has affected, adversely affected the economic interests of many countries. And um, uh, certainly there's a great deal of consciousness about it. So China has to uh, rework, I think, a lot on its relation, even with even with Nepal, you know, uh, the, the, you know, we, we now uh, we had a difficult time, but now there's a good understanding being built up because they realize that the projects which India is doing with these countries are of mutual benefit. I spoke in the beginning of mutual benefit, mutual trust. And, and mutual understanding. So if you try and build this respect and understanding and have it absolutely mutual benefit, then the trust gets built up. And that is what we need to do. So India's neighbor in the current context has played the China card against India and notable are Sri Lanka, Maldives and Nepal. Did Bangladesh ever play the China card against India? Uh, well, I think um, uh, uh, let's. I'm talking of now the last 15 years with Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has been there. So her uh, maxim of friendship with all, malice towards none, um, has meant that she has. Um, there's a very active development in the relationship with China for Bangladesh. There's a lot of trade, a lot of uh, you know projects and so on. But but uh, I think that she is at all times sensitive to India's concerns on this matter. And if there has been any problem at any time, India has never hesitated to talk about it in a friendly way. You know, we can have friendly, friendly discussions, a friendly understanding. You can, if you have good friendship and trust, you can convey all your concerns, uh, you know, in that equally um, uh, friendly manner without breaking the trust, without breaking the understanding between the two countries. So we've always worked on that basis with Bangladesh and that's gone very well. And I think that, um, but I would say that, at the people to people level, uh, you know, sometimes you do see a lot of effort by certain forces, we very well can say who they are even, uh, who try to generate an anti-Indian feeling, you know, that saying, oh, look, this is what uh, Sheikh, Hasina, uh, Sheikh Hasina has done wrong. And, you know, it's got to do something with India. You know, whatever mistake is made is then put at India's door. So India has to also be very careful of this and has to work hard to develop uh, uh, this trust and understanding with the people as well. You know, and not just leave it at government to government levels. So we have to also work very, and this is true of every country, not just Bangladesh, where developing this understanding at the people to people level is very important. And we're constantly working at that all the time. <laughs> so Indian policy establishment has been quite comfortable dealing with Bangladesh led by Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. If you look at the internal politics of Bangladesh, besides Awami League, there is Bangladesh National Party of Begum Khalid Azia, and the third is the Jatiya Party of established by General Irshad Hussein. Both those are center right uh, parties that are somewhat hostile to good relationship within India. Sheikh Hasina will not live forever. Does the Indian policy establishment have any plans for a post Sheikh Hasina scenario? How to engage Bangladesh in that situation? Uh, uh, you know, again, I, <laughs> I it's a very important question. I, um, I spoke about uh, the will of the people of Bangladesh, and this is the most important factor of democracy. So similarly, just as uh, the Awami League itself has to first decide, on what uh, the second rung of leadership. I think it is uh, Sheikh Hasina's own interest uh, that for her, her legacy will also be a peaceful uh, transition uh, within the Imami League uh, or even uh, within uh, Bangladesh itself, a uh, relationship with the people of Bangladesh that they should uh, remember the legacy of uh, Awami League, legacy of Sheikh Mujib, legacy of Sheikh Hasina and treasure those memories. So I think that um, this is very important, very important. So we also, we uh, naturally look to our bilateral relations and naturally we are happy that we've got good relations with Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Uh, but we are equally conscious that if Sheikh Hasina is to remain 
or to go ultimately because it's a democratic country it should be done peacefully by the people of bangladesh so this is as much a challenge to democracy as it is to uh, the it's a strategic concern i would say because i think that uh, you know the other parties uh, they have i mean of course we've had relations with the bnp and we believe in talking to everybody that's fine and we believe in working with anybody who's come to power like right now even in maldives we are talking to the president there uh, so all this is well but again and again i would say it's as much in sheikh hasina's own interest to uh, to to have a democratic structure within her party and to allow uh, you know the younger people to come up and to uh, to to grow and develop uh, so that the values that awami league stands for remain this is what is very important you know the the four pillars of the uh, constitution which were put in by the under sheikh mujib as a, a prime minister first prime minister, uh, prime minister uh, so those values democracy uh, secularism socialism nationalism pride in your own nation social justice for everybody you know democratic structures being maintained at all cost and secularism allowing uh, all the religions to flourish i think it would affect bangladesh adversely if there was any let let down in the secular structure of bangladesh because their democracy is because of secularism structure you know and if you if you lose that you will have an adverse impact so these are issues that i'm sure the people of bangladesh talk about and they certainly um, you know there always will be waves and think this is india has done this right or that right i don't think india has been a factor in that sense in any of the recent elections in bangladesh it's being fought on internal factors in bangladesh you know so although people keep talking maybe about india and bangladesh, but they know they know that india has really never interfered in any way in the electoral process rather we welcome the electoral process we welcome it being held regularly and on time uh, with democratic structures like the election commission the bureaucracy who looks after it and so on so it's i think in bangladesh's own interest in every party i mean now look in in the jatiyo party you know um, Uh, president ishad has passed away so they have to also look at it themselves how are they going to restructure it whether roshan ishad or president ishad's brother all these issues are there and every party is dealing with it in their own way uh, i mean even in the bnp you know uh, begum haldazia is very unwell um, her one son has passed away her another son is in uk so what's going to happen in that party there are leaders there but these are issues the people of that party have to think of for themselves and we encourage all the parties to think about this because it's important one of the major strategic concerns for india from the time of inception of bangladesh has been but really has not been talked about is the illegal infiltration of bangladeshi economic migrants into india and lack of any mechanism to repatriate them because bangladeshi governments whether they are bnp government or awami league government have refused to cooperate now yeah. that problem is creating domestic law and order situation for india because of certain actions of these illegal economic migrants what would be your observation on this particular strategic concern from bangladesh Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right that um, illegal immigration is a strategic concern. But let me tell you. I let me first put this in international context, and then come to the India situation. That you know, in Bangladesh's bilateral relations with every country of the world, illegal immigration is a huge issue. Because whether it is Europe with Italy, with Switzerland, with South Korea, uh, even with USA, so the as I I, I mentioned uh, briefly in my talk that uh, the density of Bangladesh's population is such that there is a huge pressure on people to go abroad and work abroad. Uh, so whether it is Saudi Arabia or the Gulf or Europe, or, so this is an issue everywhere, and there is no hesitation by these governments. in europe in saudi to talk to bangladesh about it so similarly i would say that in india too um, indian government should not have any hesitation in discussing this with bangladesh in a way that is friendly and is based on the understanding uh, between india and bangladesh uh, and uh, for example um, i can tell you that even in the bilateral document and this is a very interesting factor that many people don't even know that um, uh, we have at one time or the other talked to bangladesh about it uh, 
And the only time, perhaps the only time that this subject of illegal migration from uh, Bangladesh to India appears in an official document is actually when Begum Haldazia came to India, I think it was 1992. You know, when 1991 elections were held um, after the end of the military dictatorship of two uh, of Ershad and uh, Zia Rahman. So, 91, uh, Begum Haldazia won the election and she came to India in 92 and there were talks, bilateral talks, there was a document issued, joint statement, and in that it's mentioned. And in that it's mentioned that yes, this problem is there, we will solve it by discussion. So, again, and that was Khaldaz, yeah, it wasn't uh, even an Awami League government. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, this issue has always been there and uh, we have to find ways and means. I think uh, today, let me say, let me talk about two aspects of the situation, uh, which I think are very important. One, I would like to say, and this is something that is not even uh, spoken about very much, but it is tragic, that uh, through this illegal immigration, uh, from Bangladesh, there's a lot of trafficking of women and children. And this is absolutely tragic, it is horrendous, and needs to be stopped immediately. In fact, even in my time when I was High Commissioner, I was talking to the Bangladesh government all the time of finding mechanisms and ways of, you know, really looking after the, uh, the women and children who are trafficked across the border and getting them back to their families. And, um, you know, working out even a, a one noted point, you can call up a helpline, etc. So many ways we were trying to work out. But this is something that is very tragic and uh, we must uh, look at it uh, from that point of view and find ways of dealing. That's number one. And number two, I think, you know, you have in situations in states like Assam, even a problem, you know, that how do you deal with identification of uh, illegal immigrants? And I think that India's own uh, system of Aadhaar cards and um, national register and so on uh, has helped because we are getting together for the first time over 75 years by giving such a focus on individual identity of every citizen of India. So when you do that, then you are able to identify who is an Indian citizen, who is not an Indian citizen. And even in Assam, where there was a big political issue, we said that, look, it's not that if you identify that somebody is not an Indian citizen, that person is not going to be pushed out. You can give that person a work permit, you can tell the person to stay for some time, whatever it is, you know. Uh, so there are always ways and means of looking at the situation and dealing with it. It needs to be dealt with. Otherwise, when an illegal immigrant is there, that person becomes a source of great pressure for illegal activities, you know, and whether it is robberies, whether it is even terrorist attacks. I remember um, under the BNP, you know, uh, under the BNP government at that time when I was there, so many terrorist acts in India at that time seemed to have uh, some involvement by some illegal immigrants from Bangladesh, They're just under pressure, you know, you're forced to do all kinds of things. And uh, so I think that uh, this question will always remain. Um, and I think Bangladesh itself has been very good in getting ID cards for their people. So they have their own national ID card system. And India is also, you know, perfecting its own system. So I think, again, if you, if you work between the two governments and you're able to say that this person, these details, etc., photo ID, biometrics, you're able to solve the problem much quicker than before. So uh, this problem will need to be discussed. That has to be on the agenda. Yeah. Uh, Madam Ambassador, my last question to you is on jihadi radicalization of Bangladesh's civic polity. And international observers are finding that although Bangladesh is supposed to be a modern, moderate, democratic Islamic nation, but there's a lot of jihadi radicalization going on and that is reflected in the domestic media uh, simple things like, you know, India's defeat in World Cup to Australia, there was a lot of gloating over in Bangladesh. Any comments on this? This jihadi radicalization of Bangladesh poses a strategic threat to India. Yeah, I, I think uh, jihadi radicalization is a very serious problem. I think... Um, uh, not only in Bangladesh, in many other countries of the world, but right now we're talking of Bangladesh. And I think uh, the way to tackle it, I mean, that is the first thing is that you have to recognize the problem exists. And I think that this is very important and you have to see how you can tackle it. Bangladesh, I think among the average person, uh, the issue of religion has become more and more important. And uh, 
as such religion is playing a much bigger role in an individual's life than it was earlier you know uh, and i think this is the factor that has to be uh, taken on board but when you take it on board then you know you have to also explain maybe through the education system that a religion if it's a religion of peace must you know foster peace and understanding and friendship among all the education system has a lot to do with it the policies of the government have a lot to do with it and uh, sheikh hasina has tried to tackle it but at the same time she has made some concessions to the uh, uh, you know say the education of the madrasa system she has accepted their um, education degrees on par with uh, secular education degrees so there has been definitely a, a, a change in the situation uh, but i think at all times um, in our talks with bangladesh we uh, talk about joint efforts to counter radicalization joint efforts to counter jihadi groups and to counter their activities and uh, certainly the agencies on both sides are working closely on this and there is an understanding on that uh, but in the face of uh, growing radical pressure from below uh, it's a, it's a battle that is never quite won it's a battle that you have to go on with all the time and you know in 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 um, what we are finding now in recent times is that you are finding the educated jihadi you know groups like hizb tahrir and others where um, they are themselves educated people and they are appealing to the educated in bangladesh you know um, asking them to come and join and um, um the whole question of bomb making and ieds and all kinds of things you know so this you know very worrying tendencies and we've seen even in europe that they are uh, facing this problem so it's a problem i think which the world has to look at and i don't think there can be any piecemeal solution india for example we have been for many years decades uh, in the united nations uh, trying to look at a comprehensive convention on terrorism and try to get it adopted so at least certain factors but you know even the definition of terrorism is a problem even you know countries are not willing to agree on the definition of terrorism so it's it's really a serious issue and uh, you have to um, keep working at it and uh, i think that uh, i i think you know young people young people i'm talking of even primary and secondary school students it should be their mindset that you have to give them that look violence and you know uh, violence is an illegal activity violence should not be acceptable whether you're playing with your friend or whether you're playing with somebody uh, who is not your friend or somebody of your religion another religion differences sort them out but no violence you know that is something which is uh, very important to have accepted otherwise jihad comes or violence comes if you're mentally accepted that yes violence is a way out so uh, this tendency in society is to accept violence as a viable solution this is something that is uh, i think very worrisome and we have to combat it socially it can't be done by any kind of force or every country has laws of their own on the subject uh, but uh, those laws don't make any difference you know uh, you look at in usa how much uh, gun violence there is in usa you know it's not necessarily connected to religion sometimes it is but very often it is not it is just his approach that yeah you can pick up a gun and solve your problem but that's not a solution to a problem so um, it is a universal effort and i think that um, uh, it's something that uh, prime minister sheikh hasina is aware of the other political parties i haven't seen them talking so much about it but uh, i've seen the army league talking about it i've seen uh, prime minister sheikh hasina talking about it that she will not allow this to happen um, but uh, a lot more effort certainly needs to be Made. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador Veena Sikri, for coming again on our platform and delivering distinguished lecture. We hope that your new book on Bangladesh comes out very soon. Yeah, thank you. So maybe we can have a discussion about that. Yeah. yeah. And we are very honored to have you serve on our International Advisory Board. My thanks also to our audience and to Team CSA, mainly Mr. Vipudaman Pachauri. And Mr. Rajiv Verma, who helped me arrange these wonderful sessions on education about strategic studies. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Real pleasure and honor to be on your program. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Namaskar.